Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last March, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person at 6300 A Street or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of the faith that we share. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place for it. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In this time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? In our 150th year as a congregation, who are we and what are we doing? This is, as Res Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. She also says this is no time to go it alone. And this, right now, right here, is where we practice that. So take a moment as we begin the service this morning. Be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here this morning. Set aside what will come later. Be right here. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. Across the distance, the light from within me shines, sending love to all. Across the distance, your light is fuel that warms me and helps to keep my own light burning. Together, we keep the flame of community burning bright. Blessed with love 
Hello. Our story today is called One Green Apple by Eve Bunting. This is my second day in the new school in the new country. There are to be no lessons today because we're going somewhere. Other days will not be like this one. Tomorrow, I will go again to the class where I will learn to speak English. Mothers drive us to the start of an orchard where a hay wagon is waiting. We climb on and lean against the bundles of hay. The wagon is pulled by a tractor and we jolt along. I think it odd to have boys and girls sit together. It was not like this in my village. The students know each other, but they don't know me and I don't know them. I can't understand them when they speak and I can't speak to them. Some are friendly, but some look at me coldly and smile cruel sometimes. I hear my country mentioned, not fondly. I would prefer to go home. My father has explained to me that we are not always liked here. Our home country and our new one have had difficulties, he says, but it will be good for us to be here in time. How much time, I wonder. I am different too in other ways. My jeans and t-shirt look like theirs, but my dupata covers my head and shoulders. I've not seen anyone else wearing a dupata, though all the girls and women in my home country do. The girl who sits next to me smiles and points to herself. Anna, she says. She points to me. Farah. I nod and say Farah, which is my name. Then I look across the field where cows graze. I am tight inside myself. Three dogs come and run in front of us. I think they belong here and know the way. I once had a dog called Haddis. We stop at a place where apple trees bunch together. I find out we are to pick the fruit. Old apples have fallen in the grass and three dogs are eating them. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Their crunches sound like caddises. Our teacher gathers us around her. She talks to the class. Then she looks at me in a kind way. One, she says. She touches an apple, then picks it. One, she says again. I am to take only one, as the other students have done. I nod. I want to say, I understand. It's not that I'm stupid. It's just that I am lost in this new place but I don't know how to tell her. I pull away from the rest. Beside me is a tree shorter than the others that does not seem to belong. It is small and alone like me. A few hard green apples hang from its branches. I twist one off, it fits perfectly in my hand. We hold our apples and run and slide down a hill. The dogs race ahead, their ears blow backward, inside, out, pink and shiny. At the bottom of the hill is a little crooked house made of wood. I wonder if a cow lives in it or a goat. Perhaps it is the home of a shepherd. In the house is a wooden machine with a metal handle. I see no goat or cow or shepherd. The house is here for some other reason. Our teacher lines us up. One by one, we plop our apples into the machine. It will be la I will be last to drop my small green one. My teacher seems to speak, then she shrugs and smiles. A boy shouts, hey, he moves toward me as if to stop me from putting in my little green apple, but it's too late. It has already gone. There are blades inside the machine that chop the apples, ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. The students begin to push on the handle that presses the chopped up apples. The skin and the pulp stay in the bag while the juice flows through. I hang back, not sure if I should be with the others. Pushing the handle must be hard. They lean against it and grunt. I'm strong, I can help. I take a step toward them. Anna calls and waves to me to come beside her. A boy makes a place for me on the handle between them. I am pleased. We push and push. It is hard, but we're working together and we can do it. The juice drips down, drip, drip, drip. Our teacher has brought paper cups. We line up again, fill them and drink. We lick our lips. I think I taste my special apple. Apple cider, Anna says. That must be what we're drinking. I say the word inside myself where it can't be heard. 
apple. The other word is too difficult. Our teacher is speaking. She is holding out a bag for our cups and making signs that we must get ready to leave. Anna sits next to me in the wagon as we ride back. There is a boy on my side. Jim, he says, and points to himself. I nod. Jim, I say silently. Kay tickles my arms and makes Anna sneeze. It smells of dry sunshine. Jim pats his stomach and a belch jumps from his throat. Everyone laughs. I do too. Laughs sound the same as at home. Just the same. So do sneezes and belches and lots of things. It is the words that are strange. But soon I will know their words. I will blend with the others the way my apple blended with the cider. I take a deep breath. Apple. I say, Anna claps. I smile and smile and smile. It is my first outside myself word. There will be more. And that is the end of our story. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Wendy Hesterman and I'm your vice treasurer. I'd like to thank our treasurer, Teresa Forsman, and our pledge chair, Dorothy Ramsey, for their inspirational words last week, introducing our pledge theme of Let's Stay Strong. I've been asked to share some of the reasons I support the Unitarian Church of Lincoln with my pledge. As many of you know, I'm more of a one-on-one -on -one person, so this is a bit of a challenge for me, but I'm going to give it a go. We often say that we gather as like-minded people, but I'm beginning to believe that like-spirited describes us better. The brain trust of minds here at UCL truly astounds me with the variety of knowledge and talent on tap. But when it comes to caring for each other and our world, everyone seems to pull in the same direction. My story at UCL took two paths, <clears throat> one on Sundays listening to Oscar's thoughtful sermons, and the other one I want to share now, which started right here in this room. This is the path that built the awesome social and support network that I depend on. My first social activity was the LGBTQ game night, and my second was the Friday Dazzler potlucks. In both groups, I found folks who accepted me as I was, waited patiently for me to share my story, and supported me when I chose to do so. I'm by nature a very curious person, so the variety of activities available at UCL continues to astound me. Is UCL a place I can attend lectures, be part of an open circle, be a greeter, take classes, participate in the auction, be an office dazzler, attend a red grill ceremony, maybe rock out at a Thursday night service, or go to a tent revival. Well, yes, it's that and so much more. A few weeks ago, the story for all ages was about the magical word yet. Today, I want to add two more to that list. I'd like to add and and yes, and here's why. This church embraces the fact that we are all on a journey. We are never done or trained or tested to be a member. And that means it's okay to be evolving, to be in two seemingly opposing places at one time. Can I be both calmed and challenged by one of Oscar's sermons? Yes. Can I be exhausted and still energized to action? Yes. Can I be furious and still hopeful? Yes, I can. How about grounded in reason and overwhelmed by wonder? Again, yes. Can I yearn for security and change with equal passion? Yes. Can I laugh and cry as needed? Well, since I've done both here, I'm going to have to say yes to that one. And can I know that there is a pandemic that turned our world sideways and ask you, to consider your pledge. Well, that last one might be a bit of a stretch, but I'm going to do it anyway. If you've already submitted your pledge, high five. If you haven't, would you consider doing so soon? We financial folks are planners, and we love to have our metaphorical ducks in a row. Submitting your pledge of whatever amount works for you, for your family and your situation, is very much appreciated. I think that's it.
How to Listen by Joyce Sudfin. Tilt your head slightly to one side and lift your eyebrows expectantly. Ask questions. Delve into the subject at hand or let things come randomly. Don't expect answers. Forget everything you've ever done. Make no comparisons. Simply listen. Listen with your eyes as if the story you are hearing is happening right now. Listen without blinking as if a move might frighten the truth away forever. Don't attempt to copy anything down. Don't bring a camera or a recorder. This is your chance to listen carefully. Your whole life might depend on what you hear. Each week we set aside time in our worship to mark moments in the lives of the members of this congregation. We do this because one of the elemental purposes of religion is that it is a place where we hold the stories of our gathered members. And so each week we mark joy and sorrow, celebration and grief in a time set aside for that purpose. As the next song plays, if you're holding a friend, a loved one, or yourself in your heart this morning in either joy or grief, we invite you to write your name or the person who you're holding in your heart in the chat box running next to this video. Thank you for your presence. Once a month, we give the offering plate on Sunday to a local or Unitarian Universalist organization. Each year at the spring congregational meeting, our members vote to narrow down all of the nominations to 10. This month, we're highlighting the work of community crops. And here is Executive Director Megan McGuffey to tell you a little more about their work. Hi, I'm Megan McGuffey and I am the Executive Director of Community Crops. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and our mission is to provide education, advocacy, and experiences to grow local food. So we do that a few different ways. Uh, our most well-known program in Lincoln is our Community Gardens. It's also our longest running program. So we manage 11 sites across the city and we have a fees based on a sliding scale basis. So 70% of our gardeners are low to moderate income and 45% uh, of our gardeners are immigrants and refugees. So we really just want to make growing food accessible to everyone in our community because we think healthy food, good food, food that fits your cultural traditions should be a basic right for everybody. Uh, in addition to our garden program, we've got a five acre training farm where we help people launch their farm businesses. And in particular, right now, we're really proud of our Yazidi Farmers Project. So this is a, a large refugee population here in Lincoln. Many of them have great agricultural backgrounds and they're now applying those skills here in the US and kind of building the cultural food shed of their community back up by growing products that they couldn't find before here in town, which has been really cool to see. 
Um, and then we also do education for all ages. So we, we teach little tiny kids, toddlers, how to grow some of their own food and try food from the garden and, and have a healthier life in that way. And then we provide classes on uh, gardening, cooking, and sustainable living topics for all ages. And then our kind of final bucket of work is that we do vegetable sales. And that's again to kind of bridge the, the feeding people and also helping farmers. So we uh, go to farmers markets and we have our Union Bank and Trust uh, veggie van, people using SNAP and Double Up Food Bucks to buy fresh, healthy produce. Uh, and we're purchasing that directly from our beginning farmers to help them build their business. So that's Community Crops in a nutshell, and we really appreciate your support. A lot of people are struggling right now during these strange times of pandemic. So please help if you can by texting a donation, giving online through Realm, or sending a check with community crops in the memo line to 6300 A Street, Lincoln, Nebraska 68510. There's information about how to text in the chat box. Thank you for all that you do for our community. The following is a selection from an article by Benjamin Mathers. The article was called, How to Listen When You Disagree, a lesson from the Republican National Convention. She was just staring at me. She had something to say, but she didn't seem to have courage to speak to me, yet. So I waited. Finally, she walked up and, like a young warrior preparing for battle, she said, I don't usually do this, but I think abortion is wrong. It's not a form of birth control, and people who have them should be arrested for murder. Most protesters at the Republican National Convention in Cleveland were yelling about Donald Trump, for or against, all part of this beautiful circus of free speech. She was different. There was no circus here. She was serious. I had been at the RNC for a few hours. No one had opened up about a serious but controversial issue, but here she was. If there's one question I get asked more than any other, it's this. How do I listen to someone when I disagree with them? There are many ways to answer this. It takes a lot of forgiveness, compassion, patience and courage to listen in the face of disagreement. We must work to hear the person, not just the opinion. When someone has a point of view we find difficult to understand, disagreeable or even offensive, we must look to the set of circumstances that person has experienced that resulted in that point of view get their story, their biography, and you'll open up the real possibility of an understanding that transcends disagreement. Like the roots of a tree, our stories, which can create our beliefs, are completely unique and also connected. It is through story that we can find common ground enough to coexist in the face of great, often necessary, tension. When you find yourself in disagreement, just ask one question. Will you tell me your story? I'd love to know how you came to this point of view. As she spoke to me about her beliefs on abortion, I wanted to stop her and tell her my story. I've sat with two loved ones as they suffered through the difficult decision and consequences of ending a pregnancy. It was a brutal human experience and gave me an insight to something I never expected to witness. In moments like that, choice doesn't seem to be the right word. So, when she told me they should be arrested for terminating a pregnancy, the familiar burn of disagreement started to fire in me. There were so many things I wanted to say. I wanted to change her mind, to argue, to disagree. It's a natural response. But if my story brought me to my beliefs, then I needed to know how her story brought her to her beliefs. 
The Dalai Lama says, when you listen, you may learn something new. So I asked. Thank you for sharing that. Tell me your story. I'd love to know how you came to this point of view. She seemed surprised by my interest. They should be locked up. It's wrong. It's not right to go out and sleep with whoever, then just vacuum away the result like it never happened. She paused, then inhaled the entire world. And it's not fair. All I've ever wanted to be is a mom. My whole life I knew I was meant to have children. Then when I was 18, 18, the doctor told me I'd never have children. My ovaries were damaged. I kept it a secret, and when my husband found out, he left me. I'm alone, my body doesn't work, I'm old, who will ever love me? I wondered if she could hear my heart breaking. So, I, I guess I get upset when I see people who can get pregnant, who can have kids, whose bodies work, who can be moms, and they just choose not to. Sometimes there's nothing to disagree with. I didn't need to be right, I just needed to be there. She wiped away a few tears, gave me a hug, and thanked me for listening. She exhaled and walked back into the RNC free speech circus. Maybe one day she'll hear my story, but today it was my turn to hear hers. I hope she felt loved. What first attracted you to Unitarian Universalism? For me, it was the strong social justice tradition. One of my very first services talked about the need for comprehensive sex education, and I soon learned that the church regularly supports the most progressive causes near and dear to my heart. Over time, I've come to value the spiritual side of our congregation, but it was initially the faith's secular work that attracted me. Now, of course, UUs come in all different political persuasions, but it's difficult to imagine a UU who rejects seeing the inherent dignity and worth of someone just because, for example, they are transgender or because they are undocumented, just to name two categories. Our first principle is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. It goes to the core of our UU identity. But it's not always easy to feel the inherent dignity and worth of everyone all the time, is it? For example, someone pulls out in front of you while you're driving. Initially, you feel alarmed, but as the fear of the near miss subsides, often anger replaces. You think, I was trying to get places just like you were. Do you think you own the road? Did you not see me when you pulled out and nearly hit me? So you prepare the look. As you pull up next to the person at the next light, you get ready to deploy the look to show them exactly how they impacted you. And as you look over, you see a parent with two little ones in the back seat. And they are frantically trying to keep their eye on the road, but also speak to the younglings in the back. All the ire drains away. You don't feel angry anymore. You have more information now. You now understand the full story. Of course you didn't enjoy the near miss and the near accident. Of course you still wish that all drivers would try a little harder. But your anger has evaporated you can again see the driver's inherent worth and dignity once more. When we know more about someone else's life, we understand their actions and their mindset a little better. So this morning, I want to talk about whether we can apply that first principle beyond a, first, a brief traffic incident. I want to ask if we can apply it to difficult extended family conversations at Thanksgiving. Can we apply it to people who do not believe in the inherent dignity and worth of all, who have very different beliefs than ours? The answer may be yes, we may be able to stay in community with people whose beliefs are harmful or bigoted if we listen, and if we try to learn more about where they're coming from, just as Benjamin Matthews did in the reading from this morning while he was standing in front of the Republican National Convention and had a meaningful exchange with a woman who was pro-life. The Dalai Lama says, when you listen, you may learn something new. And it's not just a Buddhist worldview, 
science agrees. Peer-reviewed studies about how to change someone's mind and reduce prejudice says it can absolutely happen if we stop talking and start listening. UC Berkeley and Yale political scientists have been studying deep canvassing for several years now. In deep canvassing, community organizers go door-to-door -to, -door to discuss topics such as passing non-discrimination laws for transgender people, humane immigration policy reform, expanding rights for people with felony convictions. The canvasser takes three steps. One, ask the person's opinion and then listen non-judgmentally to their answer. Two, Ask if the person knows anyone in the affected community, an immigrant or an LGBTQ person, and ask an empathy building question like, tell me about a time when you experienced discrimination, or when was a time when someone showed you compassion when you really needed it? Three, the canvasser shares their own story, and this means the canvasser isn't just any activist, she needs to be an immigrant or an LGBTQ person or someone with a felony conviction. The inventor of this deep canvassing said, Instead of pelting voters with facts, we ask open-ended questions, and then we listen. And we continue to ask open-ended questions based on what they just told us. The idea is that people learn lessons more durably when they come to the conclusion themselves, not when someone slaps you with a statistic. It's stories, not facts, that are more compelling to people when they're changing their minds. And according to the scientists studying deep canvassing, it works. It's flipping hostile voters into supporters of the issue. Now, I want to be careful. I'm not suggesting we have to stay engaged with people holding hurtful, bigoted positions, especially if you have been wounded by past bigotry. All too often, we expect the person with less power to carry the burden of educating and bringing along the rest of us. So I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you already have the wherewithal and the emotional energy, then you might consider the lessons from deep canvassing. Telling your racist Uncle John that he's a racist, sending him links to charts proving how police interactions with people of color prove that there's a culture of cultural inequality, it's not going to work. You know that without me telling you, because you've probably tried using passion and using intellect already if you're you you. So if those don't work, what if you try deep listening instead? Remember the steps. Ask questions. Invite Uncle John to speak more and listen without judgment. Then ask leading questions about whether he's ever faced unfairness himself. Keep asking. Keep listening. I can't promise it will work, but science suggests you will get farther this way. And even if you don't change his mind, at least you may be able to keep your own mind on the first principle. You will continue to treat Uncle John with dignity rather than falling into further disharmony. In the last couple of years, I've struggled to understand more about people whose beliefs are very different than mine. Let me recommend spending 15 minutes watching the TED Talk by Megan Phelps Roper. Her grandfather, Fred Phelps, founded the Westboro Baptist Church. Megan was raised in the church compound surrounded by the virulent anti-LGBTQ teachings of her family. When she was five years old, her mother took her to her first picket line where she was given a sign to hold that said, Gays are worthy of death. When she was 23 years old, she was put in charge of the church's Twitter account to spread their zeal further. And when she was 26 years old, she left the church, which meant leaving behind her whole family, too. How did Megan change her mind? It was because some strangers on Twitter abandoned hate, abandoned name-calling, and did not give up on her. Essentially, they used deep canvassing, deep listening techniques. In her TED Talk, Megan describes most of the exchanges, both online and in person on the picket line, as hostile, a brawl, full of rage and scorn on both sides. But not all of them. A man named David, who ran a blog called Julicious, after several months of heated but friendly arguments, came out to see me as a, at a picket. He brought me a Middle Eastern dessert from Jerusalem, and I brought him a chocolate, and we talked while I held a God Hates Jews sign. There was no confusion about our positions, but the line between friend and foe became blurred. We started to see each other as human beings, and it changed the way we spoke to one another. It took time, but eventually those conversations planted seeds of doubt in me. My friends on Twitter took the time to understand Westboro's doctrines, and in doing so, they were able to find inconsistencies I'd missed my entire life. 
The truth is that the care shown to me by those strangers on the internet was evidence the people on the other side were not the demons I'd been led to believe. These realizations were life-altering. Megan Phelps Roper left the church and now lectures on how to encourage dialogue between groups or people with conflicting views. But that's not all of the happy ending. I won't spoil it for you. Spend 15 good minutes yourself to watch her TED Talk. And Megan Phelps Roper is not the only example of someone changing their mind because they were listened to. Again and again in my reading about people who left the KKK or abandoned violent extremist political groups, the theme is they left because someone didn't give up on them. Someone kept talking to them as if they had value and kept persistently trying to show them a better way. Not everyone has the patience to stay with someone whose views are appalling or violent or dangerous or dehumanizing. I'm not asking anyone to do that, especially given the potential drain on your own sanity. But I am suggesting that if you have the energy to debate people all in caps online, if you have the will to keep finding sources that prove your right to send to your racist Uncle John, if you have a wellspring fueling those activities, maybe try shifting and try deep listening deep canvassing instead. When we stay in community with people despite their beliefs, we honor their worth and dignity. It's not abandoning our principles. We're not suggesting their prejudice is acceptable. We can recognize the inherent worth of people we disagree with while continuing to vigorously reject their positions. But we may even move them if we try a different path of listening and questioning. Deep listening is embedded in our UU faith. As a faith whose fourth principle encourages each of us to undertake our own free and responsible search for truth and meaning, we're a collection of fellow church members with widely varying beliefs. Pagan UUs, deist UUs, atheist UUs all share different beliefs from the pulpit, over coffee, and in discussion groups. We listen to each other, and we each then craft our own search for truth from what we hear. During the pandemic that's closed the physical church, we're listening even more than usual. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln has had small discussion groups called Open Circles for several decades. These groups meet monthly to discuss the themes selected by the UUA, such as this month's theme, Deep Listening. In these smaller groups, you share and listen and grow into deep connection with others. And in addition to keeping the Open Circles active virtually in quarantine, our church created UU Connects to help us remain together in these times. UU Connect groups meet weekly for shorter discussion and checking in with each other. There is a new open circle forming right now, and there are multiple UU Connect groups as well. If you're interested in either one, call or email our membership associate, Kelly Ross. Our last hymn today says, If you could hear my voice, if you could only listen, if you could hear my voice, it's calling out to you. Your voices have power, and your ability to listen has power. Thank you for being part of this beloved community that continues to listen and grow together. As I find my way
Two quick announcements as our time together draws to a close this morning. First, the Winter Lecture Series is sponsoring a fall symposium with Ali on Saturday, October 17th at 9 a.m. The topic is Global Displacement, Political Conflict, and Climate Change. Also, next weekend, we're hosting a social distanced grounds cleanup at 6300 A Street at the Unitarian Church at 10 a.m. on Saturday. Please come if you're able and help us prepare the grounds for winter.